You know something's wrong when government parties accuse everyone of becoming a terrorist. Hi, this is Phil Gursky, President and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting in Russell, Canada, and you're listening to Quick Hits. You look at what's happening in Africa writ large, and uh, it, it's hard to see a lot of good news there. COVID has hit fairly severely, partly because countries are poorly governed, back to that in a second, partly because of the lack of access to vaccines, uh, overcrowded conditions, poverty, etc., etc. Another thing that Africa, unfortunately, seems to be at the forefront of these days is terrorism. And it's something I've, I've covered in a number of podcasts in the past. Don't want to repeat everything I've said before, but if you just look at basically all four corners of Africa, all the way in the northwest in Morocco, where the Polisario Front is considered by some to be a terrorist group. In the northeastern corner, Islamic State in the Sinai is still very active. They just beheaded a Coptic priest, or Coptic uh, Christian rather, a couple of weeks ago. Going down to the southeast corner, of course, you have uh, Mozambique. I've reported a lot over the past few months on an Islamic State affiliate that is wreaking havoc in the Cabo Delgado in the northeastern region of Mozambique. The French company Total, which is a major oil company, just suspended operations there indefinitely because of the violence. Hundreds of thousands have been displaced. And then finally, back into the western part of the country, you go to Nigeria, where Boko Haram and Islamic State West African province seem to be essentially acting at will against Nigerian civilians and against the Nigerian army. But I refer to African governance a way, a ways back. And I want to pick up on that today because there is a disturbing trend in parts of Africa for governing parties, uh, many of which have been in power for years, if not decades. They keep changing the constitution and and the country's laws to allow these so-called presidents to run indefinitely despite term limits in the original legislation. These governments, these presidents slash dictators for life, have this annoying practice of not just preventing opposition figures from running for office, but actually labeling them as terrorists. I want to explore that a little bit in today's Quick Kit. So the story that made me think about this was in a recent edition of The Economist, the April 10th edition. And it's an article in their um, Middle East and Africa section entitled, Benin and Chad Getting Too Much Alike Alas. So I want to read a few excerpts from this article to sort of set the tone for what I'm talking about today. Essentially, Benin is a, com- a country of about 12 million people. It had been a democratic beacon, this is quoting The Economist, in West Africa. They voted out a, a um, longtime president in 1991. And so it seemed like the country was on the road to democracy. Uh, alas, uh, there is a uh, former cotton magnet, love the word magnet, who came to power promising to consolidate democracy. And he's done pretty well everything but that. Now, there is a new law that's being propagated because of this, the actions by this president which is supposed to be for economic crimes and terrorism, but is being used to target Mr. Talon's rivals. And the latest is a woman called Rekia Madugu, who is a high-profile would-be candidate for president in Benin. And she's been barred for standing for election and was in fact arrested back on March the 3rd and later charged with financing terrorism and plotting to kill two political figures. Now, there's absolutely no evidence that this woman is A, a terrorist, or B, is planning to kill anybody. But the the government of Mr. Talon is using legislation to essentially silence the opposition, to prevent them from challenging him in election, and essentially label them as terrorists. Now, unfortunately, Benin is not the only country doing this. I came across two recent articles um, in online, one regarding Tanzania. This is back in November of last year, of, of 2020. It says Tanzanian opposition leaders say that police arrested key colleagues and charged them with terrorism-related offenses and sealed off areas where peaceful protests were about to begin. Again, the use of terrorism to quieten the opposition. More recently, in Rwanda, a man who was once portrayed as a hero in the Hollywood movie about the Rwandan genocide has, in fact, been charged with terrorism and has been brought to trial. This is a man named Rusisa Bagina. He is a rival 
to Rwandan President Kagame, Paul Kagame. And as a consequence, he's being charged with terrorism. Now, as I noted in the my early, my introduction to this, this podcast today, it's not that Africa is not beset with terrorism. It certainly is. There are real terrorist forces fighting on an, in a number of countries, probably more than half the countries of Africa right now. And they're a serious bunch. And I often wonder why these actual terrorists are dismissed as insurgents, militants, whatever kind of thing, when they are in fact 100% bona fide terrorists. They are engaged in violent actions for political, ideological, or religious reasons. They are not a militia. They're not a bunch of people, you know, running around killing people for no reason. They're killing them for a reason. So you want me to stop because people are getting hurt, right? But Sam, what if I'm making the world a better place? Bottom line is, is that the groups in Africa, almost to a person, or rather to a group, are in fact Islamist extremists. They're jihadis. So it's, I think when we look at Africa uh, as a continent, we have to recognize at least three things. The first is that, yes, terrorism does represent a threat uh, on a continental scale. I've seen some analysis lately that, in fact, Africa is taking over from the Middle East and Asia as sort of the most worrisome hotspots on the planet when it comes to terrorism. I think there's some evidence for that. Secondly, that governments are using the label terrorism inaccurately on occasion to dismiss those who want to replace them in power. This, I think, is, a, is a, an unfortunate after effect of the so-called war on terrorism, a term you've heard me hate time and time and time and time again. They are using this notion that terrorism is a threat to essentially give that name to anyone who poses a democratic threat to them. I guess in the thought that, A, if the public believes they're terrorists, they won't vote for them. And at a minimum, they can use existing laws to try these people. So that's not good. I think the term terrorism um, is useful sociopolitically at describing a particular type of behavior? Or do you feel it is frequently coded to refer only to some groups to deliberately delegitimize their violence, but not as much to other groups um, to sort of preserve a, a veneer of legitimacy to their violence? Damn, another tough question. The, the, the bottom line is, is that there is no consensus of what terrorism means. The third thing I want to weigh in on, and this is tangential to my conversation today and might get me into some trouble with some listeners. African governance is generally piss poor. There are so many countries on the continent that are poorly governed by presidents that ignore the law, that ignore the constitution, that change the rules in the middle of the game. In other words, as I referred to earlier, they will issue uh, presidential term limits. Many constitutions say that a president can only run once or maximum twice for office. We have presidents that are running three, four, five, six, seven times, essentially, you know, snubbing their nose at their populations and at their populations' constitutions. And a lot of this is on the shoulders of the current bunch of yahoos governing African states. An awful lot of people will point to colonialism by the French and the British and the Germans and the Italians and the Belgians, which was a horrendous part of African history. There's no question about that. And it should not be dismissed and it should be recognized. But these nations have been independent for the better part, and more in most cases, well over half a century, in some cases more so. They have done a royal job of screwing up governance themselves. And I just think that we're at a point now where we can't keep pointing figures at colonialism as the reason for all the bad things that are happening in Africa. Yes, there are still some effects that'll probably take a few more generations to peter out, but we have to hold the current leaders of Africa responsible for their own actions, for their own decisions, and for their own policies. And one of those policies, labeling opposition leaders as terrorists, simply has to stop. You don't see that happening in Western countries. You see it happening in Africa and in Middle Eastern countries and in Asian countries. This is just one more way for despots to keep power. Anyhow, that's my view. I do want to leave you, as usual, with words of wisdom from the Hardy Boys and from Nancy Drew. Today is from Nancy's, this is from Nancy. 
oh, this is good for all intelligence officers or wannabe intelligence officers. It comes from the clue of the broken locket. Do not press new acquaintances to talk if they are visibly upset. Well, I guess if Nancy's recruiting a human source and the human source has been through a bit, she might want to cut him a bit of slack. Sage advice again from Nancy Drew, girl detective. Anyhow, that's what I think about what's happening in Africa with these false accusations of terrorism. What do you think? Love to hear from you. You can reach me on email, borealisrisk at gmail.com or on Twitter at borealisaves. You can also find me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you like this content, want to get more, go to the website, borealisthreatenedrisk.com. Hit the subscribe button. You'll get a free daily digest, all the podcasts, all the blogs, Today in Terrorism, as well as a link to my new book, The Peaceable Kingdom, A History of Terrorism in Canada from Confederation to the Present. Here it is right here. You can order the book online. It's only $25 Canadian plus postage and handling, depending on where you are in the world. Love to send you a signed copy. Hope to hear from you soon. We'll talk again. Until then, stay safe.